Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's talk, which is part of our Modern Design History Seminar Series, uh, co-convened by myself and my colleagues, Professors Catherine Whalen and Freya Hartzell. Today's speaker is Nancy Deal, Chair of the Department of Art and Art Professions at NYU. Nancy has a BA in Art History from Rutgers and received her MA in Costume Studies from New York University. She is a historian of fashion who specializes in the period from the mid 19th century to the present, concentrating on the American fashion industry. Nancy has many years of experience in the field of modern and contemporary art, and she's especially interested in connections between fashion and art practices. She has been with the art department since 2003 as director of costume studies. She previously taught at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Nancy is the co-author with Daniel James Cole of The History of Modern Fashion, 2015, published by Lawrence King, and is the editor of The Hidden History of American Fashion, Rediscovering 20th Century Women Designers, 2018, Bloomsbury. Other writing and editorial projects include guest editorship and numerous contributions to Grove Art Online, Oxford Art Online, an article on the fashion and costume designer Zelda Wynn Valdez for Oxford's African American National Biography, articles in Bestoy and The Conversation. Her chapter on modernist fashion of the 1920s appeared in Charles Sheeler, Fashion Photography and Sculptural Form, 2017, published by the James A. Michener Art Museum. Uh, one of my favorites, Slippery Slopes, Skiing, Fashion, and Intrigue in 1960s Film, co-authored with Marilyn Cohen, a BGC alum, appeared in Leisure Cultures and the Making of Modern Ski Resorts, 2019, Palgrave. Nancy contributed a chapter on the American fashion designer Wesley Tan to Black Designers in American Fashion, 2021, published by Bloomsbury, and she lectures widely on fashion history topics. The title of Nancy's talk today is Expanding the Narrative, Researching Black Fashion Designers. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Nancy after I just do a little housekeeping here. Um, a word on today's event. Uh, Nancy will speak for about 30 minutes and then we will open things up for questions and discussion. For the question and answer session, please use the Q&A function. We have a number of colleagues joining us as panelists. For the panelists, please use the raised hand function and I will call on you to unmute and ask your question. We have automatic captioning, which you can turn on using the CC option at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this event and a copy of the video will be available on our website and YouTube channel afterwards. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks for such a nice welcome. Um, I wanna make sure that you can hear me? Um, is that the case? That is the case. Okay, thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here and I appreciate the invitation and you um, also appreciate the opportunity to share my research. Um, it seems a favorable moment to address, inve uh, investigate and address American fashion, um, given especially the current exhibition at the Costume Institute at the Met which address, directly addresses perceptions of the American fashion industry. And while their focus is to enlarge the, um, let's say the emotional or emotive qualities associated with American fashion, my quest has been to expand the narrative um, by giving credit through research and recelebration of individuals in the industry who have been overlooked and hidden. Um, most recently, this has taken the form of invest in-depth investigations of two African-American designers, both of whom worked in New York in the mid to late 20th century, and the process of researching their lives and careers and the opportunity to add their stories to publications has been really gratifying. So I'm going to start this presentation by individually introducing the two designers and then talking about the process. So let me begin with Zelda Wynn Valdez. I'm gonna share some of her information about her biography and career via relevant images. So um, 
Zelda Wynne Valdez is not completely unknown in fashion history. Um, she appears in Rosemary E. Reed Miller's book, Threads of Time, The Fabric of History, Profiles of African-American Dressmakers and Designers, 1850 to the Present, and also in Lois Alexander's book, Blacks in the History of Fashion. Both books, however, were published by small presses in small print runs and are not widely, widely known. Um, the New York Public Library, the performance, the Performing Arts Division includes an oral history with Zelda Wynne Valdez. It was recorded in May of 1995 and mostly deals with her work with Dance Theater of Harlem. Um, this designer has also been the subject of numerous blog, blog posts and short articles that credit her with the quote, invention of the original Playboy bunny costume. And while she did not invent the original bunny costume, and I just want to say as an aside, we as fashion historians know we always need to be very wary of claims of invention or, you know, firsts in the realm of fashion. Um, while she is, that's not an accurate credit, she had a very long career. Um, it began in the 1920s and ended in the 1990s. And it deserves attention for many, many other reasons. Um, I have to say at the outset that she used several different names, including Zelda Wynne, Zelda Valdez, and Zelda Wynne Valdez, reflecting the fact that she was married and widowed twice. Um, and her business was identified variously as Zelda Inc., Zelda Modiste, and Shea Zelda. So for ease of presentation, you might hear me calling her Zelda. Um, first important aspect of her career is her roster of clients. Um, it was, it, she had a long list of internationally known celebrities, including Josephine Baker, Ella Fitzgerald, Eartha Kitt, Jesse Norman, Diane Carroll, Marian Anderson, Dorothy Dandridge, Ruby D, Gladys Knight. You get the idea. And she also outfitted the wives of male celebrities. So for example, Edna Mae Robinson, the wife of the boxer Sugar Ray Robinson, was a very loyal client and had a wardrobe full of pieces by Zelda Wynne Valdez. And she often modeled the designer's creations in fashion shows. Um, we see her here in what was described as the most fabulous gown ever seen in Alabama society. This was a fashion show sponsored by the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority at Alabama State College in Mobile in 1953. Um, and the dress was described as 20 pound, a 20 pound creation of white satin completely covered with jewels. And it took two people to put her in it. And I quote that description from Jet Magazine on April 16th, 1953. Um, another important aspect of uh, Zelda's career was that she moved between doing fashion design and costume design. Um, sometimes those are very distinct categories, but she did both simultaneously throughout her whole career. She also focused on the custom market, and that's a market that's not widely discussed in the history of American fashion. We know about the in-house salons at the great department stores, um, such as Sophie of Saks, um, but we acknowledge very few individuals who were involved in the custom market. Charles James and Anne Lowe, another African American designer, are two of the few that really receive any mention in the dominant narrative of American fashion. Um, and another important aspect of her career is its relation to the civil rights movement. Um, we Popularly, popularly perceived the civil rights movement as having begun in the 1950s and really only picked up steam in the 60s. But even through chronicling the activities of this fashion designer, it becomes clear that the immediate post-World War II period was actually quite important. So her professional life spanned more than 60 years. Um, and these were particularly significant years in the history of the US. 
during which racial segregation was enforced and a fashion system existed that was created for and maintained by Black Americans alongside the mainstream fashion industry. And through her professional success, and I will say that Zelda Wynne Valdez was financially successful. Um, she was able to employ fashion in ways that were aligned with the goals of the civil rights movement and help forge a positive Black American identity. So um, a bit about her biography. She was born as Zel Zelda Barber, that's her maiden name, in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania in 1905 and died in New York City in 2001. And she, her first job in fashion was in her uncle's tailoring shop in White Plains, New York where she moved after graduating from high school and music school in her hometown. Um, by 1935, she had established her own business in White Plains and was advertising herself as a quote, colored designer of fashions for women and misses. And this ad appeared in the New York Amsterdam News in um, May of 1937. Um, by 1941, she was calling her business Zelda Wind Shop and advertised her skills as a stylist, a copyist, and a designer of women's apparel. And there are, are a number of ads that appear in the New York Amsterdam News um, in the late 30s and early 40s. And an article in that paper in 1941 identified her as the proprietor of, quote, the only Negro dressmaking establishment in White Plains, end quote. And that was despite the fact that there was a significant black population in that town. Um, in 1948, she moved her business to Manhattan and opened a store on Broadway at 158th Street where she was closer to her growing clientele. And two events in that year exemplify how her work was important in race relations in New York. The first was the wedding of Maria Hawkins Ellington to Nat King Cole on March 28th, 1948. It was Easter Sunday and it was a major event. It took place at the Evesinian Baptist Church um, and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was the officiant. Um, and it seemed to kind of temporarily lift the everyday barrier between the races in the city. At the time, Nat King Cole was one of the most popular male vocalists in America and um, indeed internationally. And Maria, the bride, was also a singer who had been um, a vocalist with, among others, Duke Ellington and Count Basie. Um, Zelda Wynn outfitted the whole bridal party. And you can see that there are seven bridesmaids um, and the wedding party was interracial. And this was actually noted in the press. Um, unusual, unusually for the time, the New York Times included a mention of this wedding. Um, and that was really unusual that Black Americans would have been included in the wedding section of the New York Times. Um, this was actually no, the interracial nature of the, widal, the bridal party was noted in the press, but attributed to the fact that the friends of the bride and groom came from the world of entertainment. The implication being that musicians and performers were somehow more open to integration. Um, the bridesmaids and the bride wore ice blue satin and the bride's expensive beaded gown had been a gift from her aunt who was a prominent educator in North Carolina. And just to give you a close up of this fabulous dress that was created for the occasion. Um, the gowns were praised in the society pages of the African American press. And just to give you a scale, you know, a, a notion of the um, scale of the event, photo documentation of this wedding can be found um, through Getty Images. So in addition to this triumph, again in 1948. She also unexpectedly played a role in the integration of New York City's Golden Jubilee. And that was a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the consolidation of the five boroughs that included a parade and exhibitions and several fashion shows highlighting New York's garment industry. 
um, a young African-American woman was included at the last minute in a fashion show in an attempt by the organizers to silence accusations of racial discrimination. And I'd like to note here that this action was described in the New York Amsterdam News as, quote, the committee found itself with the problem of either accepting pretty Mildred Joanne Smith, Broadway actress and occasional model, or of being branded guilty of racial discrimination, end quote. However, although she was accepted as um, for participating in the fashion show, she was not assigned anything to wear. So Zelda Wynn quickly created a spectacular white, and spectacular is how it was described, a white evening gown for her to wear. Um, in the post-World War II period, Zelda was an important figure in organizing efforts within the fashion industry. Although she was successful, she recognized that um, she, like other black designers, had professional limitations. And she was one of the founders of the National Association of Fashion and Accessory Designers, also called the NAFADS, um, an association of black designers established in 1949 with the sponsorship of the National Council of Negro Women. And she maintained a leadership role within the organization for many years. Um, this organization made continual efforts to connect with the larger American fashion industry. Um, these working designers sought recognition for their work and they also mentored students and young designers and um, created a network. This photograph from the 1950s shows the national board on a trip in Washington, DC, and Zelda Wynn Valdez is in the front row wearing a hat all the way to the right. One of their outreach strategies was to have representatives from 7th Avenue serve as speakers and consultants and like competition judges. And over the years, uh, speakers at NAFAD conventions included the publicist Eleanor Lambert, the designer Charles James, and the milliner Lily Dashe. Um, at their 1962 convention, the NAFADs honored, quote, America's best dressed Negro women. And just one kind of side note here, it included Dr. Jean Noble, who was at that time an assistant professor of education at NYU. So the, the years of Zelda's career corresponded to a time in which we know that female glamour, precise grooming and a mature, mature polished aesthetic was fashionable. And fashion shows themselves were popular features of meetings and luncheons and fundraising events. Um, and often these fashion shows focused on evening dresses and special occasion outfits. And that was the realm in which she really excelled. And this glamorous image was um, especially noted in her work for performers. So for example, the eye-catching gowns she created for the cabaret singer Joyce Bryant helped the chanteuse move into the national spotlight. Um, here she is, here's Joyce Bryant photographed by Carl Van Vechten in 1953 in a photo shoot that highlighted the provocative image of the singer and also her gowns that were all custom made by Zelda Wynn Valdez. So let me show you another example. A 1954 article claimed that many of these gowns were so form fitting that the singer couldn't sit down in them, um, forcing her to quote, develop a glide to move on stage. For Ella Fitzgerald, a longtime customer, Zelda created many dresses over the course of the singer's career, but often by a long distance. Um, in an interview in, New York, in the New York Times in 1994, Zelda said that she, quote, only fit Fitzgerald once in 12 years. I had to do everything by imagination for her. She liked fancy clothes with beads and appliques. End quote. And as for accommodating changes in the sig uh, singer's figure, she said she would see images of her and say, hmm, I have to make those, the next dress a little bit larger. Um, this dress 
which was made for Ella Fitzgerald in the late 1940s, is in the collection of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it's the only extant garment I have been able to uh, locate by Zelda Wynn Valdez. And we'll talk a little bit more of that later. Um, during the 1960s, she worked with Harry Yu, um, H-A-R-Y-O-U. That's the acronym for the Harlem Youth Opportunities Unlimited. It was a social service organization that was founded in 1962 and was often referred to as an anti-poverty program. Um, we see her here with students in the program where she taught fashion design and sewing. And it was through her work with this organization that she met Arthur Mich Mitchell, the founder and director of Dance Theater of Harlem as his nieces were in the program. And her work with Ar Arthur Mitchell actually began in 1970 when she was already 65 years old. So while her earlier designs for performers had focused on this um, kind of fashionably restrictive silhouette, her work for Dance Theater of Harlem actually had to celebrate the freedom of movement and the spectacular um, athleticism and form for which the troupe's dancers were known. One of her innovations was tights dyed to match, this tights and shoes dyed to match the skin tone of each dancer, which was an aesthetic departure, of course, from the standard pink of ballet, and one that really respected the range of skin tones associated with the Dance Theater of Harlem's members. And now we have to address the bunny costume. And I've chosen this particular image in particular, this particular image um, for a reason. Um, it shows Marion Barker, who was a professional model and also a Playboy bunny at the New York club with the singer, Jackie Wilson. Jackie Wilson and it appeared in Jet Magazine in December of 1962, which is when the Playboy Club in New York opened. So Zelda Wynn Valdez did not design the original Playboy Bunny costume. There are numerous detailed memoirs in the book, The Bunny Years, written by someone else um, from Chicago describing how the bunnies, when the bunnies in the Chicago club, which was the first to open, and it opened in 1960, um, procured elements from their costumes at a local um, foundation shop. And the development of the costume or the uniform as it's more um, properly called, was really in the hands of Hugh Hefner and his current, current girlfriend. However, when the Playboy Club opened in New York in December 1962, um, Zelda got the contract, she and her workshop got the contract to fabricate at least 35 of the costumes that were worn by the bunnies. And based on that job, she developed a good working relationship with Hugh Hefner, and in fact was the first to stage a fashion show at the New York Playboy Club, and she did a series of shows that began in 1963. Um, and she was probably the first to stage a fashion show in any Playboy Club. Um, and her connection with Playboy Enterprises is really important because it was not a segregated space. There were white bunnies and black bunnies and Asian American bunnies, and the clientele was integrated. Also, she never claimed to have invented the bunny costume. Um, it's a posthumous claim that has been applied to her. Um, and I, I really think it's, um, it's a legacy of racism in the fashion industry that perhaps forced more recent journalists to an overzealous association, an over, overzealous assertion of her legitimacy. But ironically, this Playboy costume myth has contributed to a rediscovery of her long and rich career. And my second um, research subject had a very different trajectory. Um, this is Wesley Tan. He's been frequently cited as a mentor and a pioneer, um, a tribute to his 
presence on 7th Avenue. And his fashion designs were described as uncluttered, refined, and distinctive. And younger designers um, have noted his influence and help on their careers. In accounts of Black participation in the industry, he's repeatedly included as a groundbreaking designer as a result of having his own label. For example, he was included in Essence Magazine's 1991 article, article called Brothers on 7th Avenue, Then and Now. And in J.C. Penney's 1999 ad campaign, J.C. Penney's J.C. Penney salutes a remarkable color in the fashion world, black. Carl Van Vechten photographed Tan in May of 1962, and it's significant that he's that he's pictured holding and appreciating um, good fabric because luxury fabric was really part of his aesthetic and it was always important in his career. Uh, Wesley Tan was born in Rich, Rich Square, North Carolina in 1928, and he died in Newark, New Jersey in 2012. As a teenager, he left home and went to live in Washington, DC, where he attended high school and then Howard University. And later in life, he said that exposure to the Afro affluent African-American society in DC was really important to his confidence and shaped his desire and his ability to move in such company. Um, about 1947, he moved to Hartford, Connecticut, where he held a variety of jobs and attended fashion design school at night. By 1954, he was in New York City and he was working in a dress manufacturing company. Um, he worked for a number of firms throughout the 1950s. And in 1960, he became chief designer for a company that designed clothes for their own shops. I don't know the name of the company. And they allowed him to sell some of his unused designs to other firms. So that got his name around the industry. And as he told the Baltimore Afro-American in 1962, quote, gave him the confidence to establish his own company in February of 1961. He set up a business on West 27th Street and much was made of this like off 7th Avenue location in the Flower District. Um, the space was small and he only had a couple of employees, but um, very high quality workmanship was a key element of Tan's ethos and his signature. And being off 7th Avenue contributed to his reputation for originality and exclusivity. This article from Women's Wear Daily from February 21st, 1962 is typical of the appreciative and enthusiastic reception he got when he um, opened his own business. Um, he's, he was often called creative individualist um, and this young individualist here is um, highlighted with three illustrations and a photo of the designer. And only a month later, Women's Wear Daily uh, featured a two page spread on him, again with sketches and a photo of the designer and some descriptive text. So very soon after the establishment of his own business, his designs, which were rather high priced for, you know, ready to wear by an up and coming designer. Um, for example, a day wear priced in the range of 90 to $225 and up to $450 for an evening look. Um, his designs could be found in prestige retailers, including Lord & Taylor and Bendel's, Neiman Marcus and iMagnon. And it's important to keep in mind that retail in the early 60s was moving away from a de department store aesthetic and shoppers were increasingly focused on boutique experience. So youth and originality were prized. However, Tan wasn't interested in what he called, um, you know, kicky or trendy looks. Um, his designs appealed to women who were looking for simple lines and high quality fabrics, um, what he called um, a particular woman. And in 1962, he did a collection based on Indian sari fabric that was covered in the New York Times. 
Um, it's worth mentioning that Jacqueline Kennedy had traveled to Pakistan and India in March of that year, and she used sari material for some new clothes as well. So sari material for dressmaker fashions were in the news. Um, Jacqueline Meyer, who was Miss America of 1963, is posed here in a tan design, uh, Wesley tan design, two colors of textured cotton. This is actually a promotional image for the fabric. Uh, the simple color blocked batonic sheath with what's evidently a matching coat is very typical of his style. Um, and when I met and interviewed Wesley Tan's sister, she told me that she had had a version of this dress in black or navy and pale yellow, and it was one of her favorites. Um, in 1963, town and country included an evening coat in a beautiful brocade. <clears throat> he, said he, <clears throat> he said he had used upholstery fabric that season, but obviously being included in town and country, was evidence of his upmarket appeal. This is a photo of Wesley Tan in 1965 with a model. <clears throat> it's a photo from the Newark Star Ledger archive. I'm not sure it was ever published, but again, it reinforces his aesthetic of simplicity. Um, and as it turned out, 1965 was the last year of Wesley, Wesley Tan's solo enterprise. Although he claimed to have been profitable already in his second year in business, he liquidated in 65. And the rest of his career in fashion was spent in high level executive positions at other firms. But after he retired from fashion, he, produced, he pursued other design related interests, um, including an interiors company and lifestyle consulting. Um, he continued to be consulted and as mentioned before, was committed to advising and being a mentor for young designers. He was on the advisory board of the high school for fashion industries in Manhattan. And he was a volunteer instructor at Lois Alexander's Harlem Institute of Fashion. Um, he was really considered like an elder statesman of fashion, especially in the black community. Um, when Barack Obama was elected in 2008, there was a lot of excitement about the new first lady's wardrobe. <clears throat> and the New York, New Amsterdam News asked him, among other designers, <clears throat> excuse me, to suggest a look for her inaugural festivities. And he sketched this simple sheath dress. Um, after he passed away in 2012, Cory Booker, who was at the time the mayor of, New of Newark, called Wesley Tan the eternal first gentleman of the city. And in fact, a street in Newark is now named for him. So I hope that was um, help, helpful in introducing the two designers that I've been working on. Um, I'd like to you know, stop my screen share now and talk about the, the process of um, research and then we can move into Q&A. Um, I just wanna say that I first began researching Zelda Wynn Valdez in 2013, when I was asked to contribute to <clears throat> Oxford University Press's African-American National Biography, which is a collaboration with Harvard's Du Bois Institute for African and African-American Research. And the work um, eventually culminated in a book chapter, as mentioned before, and my research on Wesley Tan was begun as a contributor to Elizabeth Way's Black Designers in American Fashion, which recently was published. So that has been of much shorter duration. Um, from these brief introductions, you can see that each designer had their own trajectory and each represents a, a separate aspect of the fashion industry. So there's overlap, but there's also distinct differences. Um, so what does unite the two stories is that researching both required a departure from some kind of standard sources for fashion information. And let me say right now that we need the fashion equivalent of the archives of American art. There should be an archive of American fashion. So let's all um, put our efforts toward that. 
So fundamental to both of these projects was the historical African-American newspapers database from ProQuest. Um, it includes the New York Amsterdam News, the Chicago Defender, Baltimore Afro Afro-American, the Pittsburgh Courier and others. And I hope that um, many of you are familiar with this amazing resource, resource. Also the group of magazines published by the Johnson Group of Chicago, um, particularly Abney, Jet and Hugh. Um, but my findings on these two fashion creators were very different. Uh, information on Zeldwin Valdez was largely confined to the black press, whereas Wesley Tan received a lot of coverage in Women's Wear Daily and the New York Times. Um, perhaps it's due to the passage of time, but I also think it's a function of their very different career trajectories. Um, Zelda Wynn, again, worked in custom market and never did ready to wear. Um, although they were on different tracks, they knew each other. I found evidence that they participated in a 1962 NAFAD fashion show at the Waldorf Astoria, where Tan was cited as a promising young designer. And they, um, per they participated in a 1964 NAFAD event. And they also showed together in a 1963 fashion show that was a benefit for Jack and Jill, the cultural and civic organization. Also, I do want to mention that these projects were not spurred by extant objects. So you'll notice that I have only showed two garments. Um, the dress previously belonging to Ella Fitzgerald belongs to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And, um, oh, actually I didn't even show the Wesley Tan coat that's illustrated in the book chapter, but it's a, hopefully you'll read the chapter and see this amazing piece. Um, I know we're, going to turn to the question and answer um, section, but I just want to say that research and writing on designers, even designers who are kind of exist like at the margins of what we know, it's important, especially for museums and collectors and others who might be confronted with something with a label that they're not familiar with, but our work as scholars is to, again, expand this narrative. So thanks for the opportunity to share this and I look forward to answering any questions that may have arisen. Hi, thank you so much, Nancy. That was really interesting. Um, so um, I would ask all the panelists to turn on your cameras and use the raise hand function. Um, and hopefully I can figure this out and call on you. Um, and um, other members of the audience, um, um, please submit questions using the Q&A function. And with any luck, I'll figure that one out too. Uh, Caroline, is that you that has a question? Or was that Emma? Like the hand went up and then it disappeared. Rebecca no? has her hand up. Oh, sorry, Rebecca, how are you? <laughs> you go? There you are. Now you're in the upper left. You jumped. <laughs> you jumped squares. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Nancy. This is really important work. And thank you so much for sharing uh, both the, the content and a little bit of your process as well. And I just like to dig in a little more about some of the process. And I was I was wondering about the NAFADS group. And do they have an archive anywhere, such as the one that the fashion group has? And is there any overlap between membership in the fashion group and NAFADS or were they completely separate? Was that part of the reason why they needed an organization um, to be a counterpart of the fashion group? And, and do they have records somewhere that researchers can access? I don't know. And I um, actually, one of my like recommendations is that someone needs to really dig into the NAFAD, um, the history of the NAFADs. There's a lot in the press about them and it is possible that the, um, the Council of Negro Women that was their sponsoring organization may have the archive, but I don't really know. But 
but yes, they were the kind of counterpart to the fashion group. And you could see even from that group photograph, that was the board. It was like, it was a, it was um, a board that had a number of um, regional chapters and they were very active in, um, again, like trying to create these links with the Seventh Avenue fashion industry. Thank you. Nancy, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, the, other than the, uh, or, you know, aside from working in her, I think you said it was her uncle's or uh, relative's tailoring shop. Is that correct? Okay, did, Zelda. Zelda, Wayne Zelda do we know where she might have received? Did she receive other training? And if so, where? Okay, so she was, she never had formal fashion training. But she, um, like so many other women of her generation, learned to sew at home. And she also had um, a grandmother who was apparently very well dressed and had a dressmaker come to the home. And so she learned from her as well. Mm -hmm. And she said that young, that um, early in her life, she made her grandmother a dress that was very well appreciated. And so through that, she thought that she could, you know, um, that she had skill and she had like a talent for this. So that was like a really early um, kind of test of what she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I had two other questions, not to be greedy. Um, one was you talked about the, the fashion show that was at the Playboy Club. Mm -hmm. So uh, who was the audience? Um, clientele, like it was part of the entertainment. It, it was a series actually. Male clientele? I mean- Male, but also women. Oh, okay. It was, you know, I mean, the, the Playboy clientele, the Playboy was considered, I mean, yeah, it's, sort of a like, it's a sophisticated place. To right, right. You know, it wasn't really like louche, you know, it was um, a place where it was predominantly men, but um, remember you got a key. So there's a kind of membership component mm -hmm. and um, it was really considered like a sophisticated evening out. And she ran a number of these fashion shows, it was a whole series. It was called Zelda at the Playboy. Um, and uh, they were apparently very well appreciated. And again, because she specialized in kind of evening wear, cocktail outfits, you know, special occasion clothing, it fit in with the atmosphere of the club. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the last question I had is, the ad that you showed early on, I think it was the first ad that she placed mm -hmm. um, that specified color designer. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just not something, do you know like why she would have done, I mean, is that to indicate? Well, um, to, number one, so, so that- Black has, women that there's a designer who are, are you yeah. know, Yes, I mean, I think it was really, um, first of all, the ad was in the black press. It was in right. the Amsterdam news. Right. And there was, um, you know, in that community at that time, there was a consciousness of like, we should support each other. And I think that there's a certain comfort level that was being expressed mm -hmm. like for black women who wanted to work with someone of their own community. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was simultaneously like a reassurance to her customers, but also part of like a marketing strategy, right? To, to she was noted in an, in an editorial, you know, like not an advertisement, but like an article that, that she was a black proprietress of this establishment. Mm -hmm. So that's appealing for the community. So I, I do think it's important, yeah. And obviously, colored was the parlance of the day, right? Mm -hmm. So can we can open yeah. this up to questions from the uh, general audience or other panelists? Sorry. No, I see Caroline. Hey, Catherine, I don't want to be Caroline. Yeah, sorry. I, I have a question. Um, I wanted to know. 
Uh, and you said that Zelda Wynn Valdez had this oral history um, that was in the collection of the Performing Arts Library, I believe. And I was interested to hear about that. And, and what do you think about oral histories as a source of information for fashion? Is this something that is sort of a missing that could be um, useful to better understand this industry that's not always so written down? Um, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I found the oral history um, fantastic. First of all, it's such a thrill to hear someone's voice. Um, it is literally a tape and then there's a transcript. Um, and in it, as I mentioned, she talk, talks mostly about her work with um, Dance Theater of Harlem, but, but to get there, it's a, it's a very skilled interviewer and he takes her through her career. So it was really, really terrific to, to learn more about her career in her own words. Um, and I do think oral history is really important because we don't have the papers of enterprises um, and there's so much turnover in the fashion industry, we know that. So I, I think oral history is an underutilized resource. And I think that um, there's lots of projects waiting to be done in that realm. So thank you for asking that question. Yeah, um, this is actually a good follow-up on both um, Carolyn's and um, Rebecca's questions because it's also about sources. And uh, I was really interested in the Van Decten photographs. And are those from the scrapbooks that he kept? Um, there's a whole, they, they are um, in the library at Yale. Yeah, find the key. And there's a there's a huge repository. It's a whole series of that he did a prominent a prominent Black Americans, um, and it's a it's a it's a terrific resource. Um, and th they're there. It's 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 Black celebrities, and it's really mm -hmm. um, a, a wonderful. It's a wonderful collection of these portraits. Mm -hmm. There are many of Joyce Bryant. I mean, she was so eye catching. Yeah. And the photographs are fabulous. I mean, I could do a whole kind of slideshow yeah. on just her work, but it was also really interesting to see that um, Zelda Wynne Valdez was credited as, you know, the costumes were credited in portraits, which is something mm -hmm. that we don't often find. And I was mm -hmm. also very happy to see Wesley Tan there. That's great. Um, I, uh, I speaking because of knowing somebody who worked there, I'm looking at the, um, actually a student was looking at the photographs in terms of the backdrops. And I think she found fabric swatches. Did you come across anything like that? No. Because it was so interesting that he was showing that he, the photograph is the photograph showed Pan's designs that he's holding yes. while he's being photographed. Well, yeah. it, it, it's this fabric. It's like lace fabric. fabric. Right. And I don't know whether it was, it was um, actual textiles that you know, he had in his workshop, yeah. it was like um, photographer's props, but just the fact of using fabric mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. um, very significant and very appropriate, let's say, mm -hmm. for Wesley mm -hmm. Tan. Yeah, yeah, he definitely used a lot of fabrics as backdrops, but I didn't, had never made that association with a particular person and that textile, so thank you. Sure. Nancy, <laughs> great talk. I have a question. Um, I was hoping I, you could speak a bit more about this issue of extant garments and the sort of lack thereof. And I sort of assume just from the examples that you showed and spoke about that you sort of the main repositories you're looking at are, are obviously museums, but if you ever at any point sort of went further afield, as you're saying, sort of to non-traditional sources, thinking about sort of eBay or Etsy, or if there is any sort of resource for that. And then if you sort of in working in this area, have any anxiety about not being able to sort of access garments, like what you would have hoped to sort of get out of being able to access garments for the work. That is, yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. So, um, so there's a couple things. Um, the Smithsonian dress, um, does exist. It was the first time they kindly sent me a photograph of the label, um, Zelda Wynn Valdez's label, which is very kind of humble. It has like a needle and thread on it. Um, and there are reportedly at, 
there's reportedly at least one, if not two other pieces by her in the um, African American Museum because they were part of the Black Fashion Museum collection that Lois Alexander put together, but it still has not been entirely cataloged and so hasn't been made available. So that's one thing. So, so I have hope that more of her work is going to become um, viewable. Since I did this work, I actually got an email from someone who had found an, a garment with her label in it at a thrift shop and bought it and looked it up online. Um, and it sounded from the description like it was a slip just you know kind of almost like the lining layer of a, a, a fancy dress um, and I actually put her in touch with the museum and I don't know I, I put the um, owner of that piece in touch with the museum and I don't know what happened after that I don't collect yes I've looked on eBay I've looked you know I periodically do searches for these two designers M my suspicion is that the, the clothes for performers, we know they have a notoriously hard life, right? They are costumes. And most performers have not had the um, idea of their wardrobes as being something that's really like culturally worth saving. I think there's probably stuff out there, but it hasn't like surfaced yet. So that's the kind of, that's the case in Zelda Win Valdez. I think the exact opposite is true of Wesley Tan. Um, I know when the museum at FIT did the black fashion show a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2017, um, the Wesley Tan was uh, represented by a beautiful black coat with a wonderful black and white lining. And the owner of that ensemble, that piece, I, who I've had the fortune, good fortune to interview in the meantime, told me that that was part of a two-piece set and the dress was made of the same lining material and she wore it and wore it and wore it and wore it out. And I think that's the thing about his clothes is that people wore them a lot and they literally didn't think of them. It's not like a wedding gown. It's not like a special occasion gown, but it's like this key wardrobe piece that they didn't save. I have hopes again, though, that, you know, some more pieces um, by him will surface. And um, as you may know, you know, obviously I'm in touch with Elizabeth Way quite a bit, and I actually have come across some one person in my in my research that I think um, we need to kind of target and ask if she still has any of her Wesley Tan uh, garments. So so that's that's the story with that. Um, Nancy, there was a comment which has now disappeared um, from um, was from Lee Wishner um, saying that she's identified fabrics in Van Vechten photographs, which is a side project for her. Um, <laughs> she's working on her book of on American textiles. Um, and there's a question: uh, Were there many other or any other African American designers and fashion professionals that we don't know about? And did any of them target their business to the African-American market? Yes, there are, there are many. I mean, I feel like this is just, this is another plea to um, go into the black press, like really start the search. Yes, there are, there are professionals. There are people that were creating um, with um, black customers in mind. Um, and I think that so much work needs to be done to kind of like excavate this information and bring their careers up into the spotlight. And I think that's the, the way to start is by looking at the newspapers. So I'm looking, oh yeah, Samuel. Um, just to kind of follow up on that, um... Uh, I am kind of wondering, like, what, where, where does this field grow? Kind of once we've identified so many um, of these kind of unidentified people, what other work is there to do? How do we kind of, yeah, I don't, I'm not really sure what this question is, but I think there's, there's more work to be done in terms of like, how does the, the Black fashion 
history get written? Is it just about the designers or is there other stories to be told? No, I mean, I think um, there's the designer piece there. Well, there's fashion designers, there's accessory designers, there are buyers, like let's think about retail, right? Like let's think about the way um, people kind of purchased their clothes. Um, I think also there's, you know, the associated professionals, like public relations professionals we know have been really, really important in the industry. So I think there's a whole kind of picture to be created. Um, and, you know, looking at the NAF ads is a really good place to start. So um, also just consumers. I mean, I think it's really important that we, you know, in our teaching and in our research, like we don't always just show kind of unknown people wearing fashionable clothing who are white. And that's something that I've really committed to. It's like, let's show the black consumer, you know, show um, other people as participants in fashion. I think that's really, really, and also, you know, everything's interlocked and that's a very important part of like the whole picture. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. So I think um, if I figured out the Q&A, um, I'm not sure that we have any other questions from those who are not on the panel. Um, but um, so um, I guess so we'll wrap up here. Um, thank you very much, Nancy, for coming today. Um, thank you to the panelists um, and um, look out for our for more PGC Zoom events on our website. Um, so again, thank you very much, Nancy. Thanks for the opportunity. And I really just wanna encourage everybody to continue to investigate, continue to bring forward these stories. So we really do arrive at like a, an expanded version of you know, American fashion. So um, have a great rest of the day, everybody.